Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ed Kelly, Dean of Gaylord College. We're pleased you could be with us here this morning as we help celebrate a very important milestone in American journalism, the 100th anniversary of the Pulitzer Prizes. The prizes were first established for work in 1916. As you know, there have been a lot of changes in reporting the news ever since. But the Pulitzers have been a gold standard that remains as coveted as ever. To commemorate the anniversary, the Pulitzer Board in New York urged news organizations and journalism programs around the country to develop ways in their local communities to prompt discussions of important issues pertinent to their locales. Here in Oklahoma, a group of top journalists and journalism educators convened last winter to take up the Pulitzer Challenge. What they decided and was received enthusiastically by the Pulitzer Board at Columbia University is the program you're going to see over the next 70 or 75 minutes or so, one that focuses on the issues of journalism and trauma, a familiar story to Oklahoma. Our program this morning is the second of three events here in Oklahoma related to the aforementioned issues of journalism and trauma to mark the centennial. The first event was last night at the University of Tulsa. This afternoon, the third and final event will be held at the University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond. The partners who brought you this program, as well as other events in, in Tulsa and Edmond, are the three universities, OU, TU, and UCO. Other important partners in the planning for and organizing the three events are the Oklahoma Press Association and the Oklahoma City National Mu Memorial and Museum. We had great sponsors, led by a major gift from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation in Oklahoma City. Other sponsors are the Dart Center for Journalism and Trauma, the Lorton Family in Tulsa, and several University of Tulsa entities, the Social Sciences Interest Group, the Henry Kendall College of Arts and Sciences, the Tulsa Institute of Trauma, Adversity, and Injustice, and the Department of Communication. Members of the planning committee I mentioned early deserve a salute too. They are Joe Height of UCO, and Alana Newman of TU, who are the planning co-chairs. Also, Kerry Watkins and Marianne Eckstein of the Oklahoma City Nash Memorial and Museum. Lisa Sutliff of the Oklahoma Press Association. Mary Carver at UCO Communication. And my two colleagues here at Gaylord, Dr. David Craig, our Associate Dean, and Dr. Alani Stain, the Area Head for Journalism at Gaylord. I'd also like to recognize other people in the audience today, particularly a group of folks from Pakistan. That includes four colleagues visiting this semester under an exchange with the University of Gujarat, supported by the U.S. State Department. There are also Pakistani journalists visiting Gaylord College this week under another grant we at Gaylord administer with the U.S. State Department as well. Would those of you here in the room from Pakistan, would you mind either standing or waving so we could recognize you? Down here in front, thank you all for being here. Also in the audience is Seth Prince, an OU grad who works in student media here at OU. He was a copy editor for the Oregonian News Organization in Portland that received the Pulitzer Prize in Public Service in 2001 for a story about abuses by the INS. Where is Seth? Seth's over here. Thank you for being here today as well. And the aforementioned Joe Height. Joe is down here on the first row, the co-chair of the planning committee was the editor of the Gazette in Colorado Springs when it received a Pulitzer Prize in 2014. Joe? I'm going to take a point of personal privilege here today to introduce the editor of my hometown newspaper, the Perry Daily Journal in North Central Oklahoma. Gloria Brown is down here on the second row. Back uh, early in this century, she hired a young girl named Haley Branson at the age of 15 to come work for the journal and do stories while Haley was in high school, at Perry High School. Today, Haley is up on the dais at the age of 28 as a Pulitzer Prize winner working for the Los Angeles Times. I'm so glad Gloria's here today to see Haley be honored as well as honoring you for what you did to put her on a path to success. So again, thank you for being with us. <laughs> 
Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend Kerry Watkins, who is Executive Director of the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum. Kerry is also an OU grad and a member of Gaylord College's Board of Visitors. Kerry? Thank you, Ed. It's always great to be in God's country. Um, thanks for having us. Let me introduce a video that we did um, about a Pulitzer winner, an Oklahoman named Anthony Shadid. And um, if you know Anthony, his family here, some go by Shadid. He chose to change his pronunciation to Shadid because of his Lebanese descent, and he worked many hours in behind the scenes in Syria, covering the wars and the stories for um, Associated Press, Boston Globe, Washington Post, and finished his career at the New York Times. <clears throat> Anthony um, was a great Oklahoman and came home often and was proud of his roots here and uh, was, was frequently a guest here at the school or talking to the reporters and the journalists at the Oklahoman and other people who would want to pick his brain for his expertise and knowledge. But he was very well known for going behind the scenes and telling the human side of the story. He also pushed editors. He was known for being tough and uh, not letting editors change his words and his phrases that he liked to use. His last article that he wrote was published, a 1600 word article on the front page of the New York Times, a very large article of, you know, um, the newspapers, they would, they struggled with how much space he wanted and how much space his articles took. But because of his humanization of the face of terrorism, he was always willing to go the extra mile, and he did that. Anthony was held in, um, as a, as, was arrested for uh, cover, some of his coverage in 2011, and was held for eight days and beaten while he was held, and physically hurt and mentally tortured. And he came home to the, and we had a homecoming for him at the memorial in, in April of 2011. It was a remarkable night where people packed the audience to come hear what it was like for his time in captivity and his insight into what he had seen. And then just a year later, he would die uh, covering stories in the same area um, of a kind of an allergic asthma attack. But um, he has a great story to share. And we, we captured a good portion of that while he was home visiting and telling his story about, the, about his captivity. So uh, let me introduce to you Anthony Shadid, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a journalist who has experienced both the impact of trauma and has set a great example of courage. Anthony Shadid always looked ahead, past the bylines and the deadlines, to a world at peace with itself. That search led him to tell the stories of ordinary people caught in conflict. I would never call myself a war correspondent, the opposite. I actually cringe at the term. I cover conflict because it's a part of a region that I deeply care about, uh, the Arab world. If conflict is part of that change, a part of that reality of what's going on in the Arab world, then I feel like it's incumbent upon me to try to bring meaning to it. As a foreign correspondent, his writing explains in a most human way how people are impacted by violence and terrorism. He gives a voice to people who live in the margins of history, insight that comes only from being there on the ground, not only for the main story, but for the aftermath. Because it's the day after that people forget about but really, that's when the tragedies come through. That's when the loss is registered. That's when the scale of, you know, of what has happened is, is, is most viscerally felt. We bear witness that if we're not, not there, then people aren't going to know what's happening. What I've always enjoyed coming back to Oklahoma City or coming to the memorial here is that, you know, we understand the full impact of what terrorism really represents. W. Stephen Steve Williams. Violence can only happen in the context where people are dehumanized, where humanity is lost. You know, for somebody to commit the crime that was committed here in Oklahoma City, uh, people could not be seen as people. Anthony would have firsthand experience with that in the spring of 2011, while covering the Arab Spring unrest. He and three other New York Times journalists were kidnapped by the Libyan military. They were blindfolded and beaten. 
no stranger to the hostility journalists face there, Anthony and his colleagues would be fortunate to leave North Africa with their lives. And they finally did force us on our stomach, and I looked up at the soldier, and he said in Arabic, shoot them. And, um, uh, and then it, again, it felt like minutes, but it was probably just a few seconds. Uh, someone else said, you can't, they're Americans. And, and they didn't. After six days, they were released, Anthony returning to his family at an emotional homecoming. It was just so moving to see how people in Oklahoma responded to this ordeal, their prayers. It's something I never expected. And when you worry about not coming home, home becomes a lot more important. To want to do that is a matter of commitment to tell the story of something that's important in the world. Fellow Oklahoman Mike Betcher, also a veteran international correspondent, believes Anthony's gift of communication came from a simple Oklahoma trait. This is what was the power of Anthony Shadid, and it was rooted in the state of Oklahoma and the sensibilities we have here because he could talk to people. He could relate to people. Unless you can really go write the story in a way that connects with the rest of America, then it means nothing. He could do both. Whether in the Middle East or Middle America, he identified with ordinary people, continuing to write what needed to be written, not counting the shots fired, but the lives changed. It, it feels like you're doing important work. It is in the end about people, always keeping people at the center of those stories. As long as we keep that focus on that, that kind of shared humanity, those shared values that we have as people, I think that's in some ways the, the greatest antidote, terrorism and violence in general. Thank all of you for being here. We have people in this audience uh, who have seen a lot of trauma and report under the most difficult circumstances and our Pakistani journalists and friends who are here, I want to celebrate you. And I want you to take part in the end when we have questions. You know, watching this, I wanted to cry. Uh, and then what made me not cry was the fact that I'm so proud to be in a room in Oklahoma at my alma mater where you can't throw a stick in here and not hit someone who's won a Pulitzer Prize who's from <laughs> Oklahoma. <laughs> or has become an honorary Okie, John. <laughs> I want to introduce our panelists. You, you see all of their bios. Uh, and, and you can get all the details, but I want to give more of a, uh, a a personal uh, introduction to each and one of them. Hannah uh, is the gold standard of foreign reporting. I was always amazed in Baghdad seeing you work. And all I can say is when I grow up, I want to be Hannah Allen. Uh, magnificent work that kicked all of our butts all the time in Iraq. And she continues to do that now, continue to do it during the Arab Spring. And, Welcome back home to the University of Oklahoma. Haley, you know, you have students you see come through here who have great potential. Some of them live up to it, some of them don't. And if they don't, that's our fault as professors because we just didn't inspire enough. But Haley Branson Potts and her husband Mark Potts are two who did live up and are living up to their potential and at 28 years old, a Pulitzer Prize. And so proud of you. Ed Kelly, a fellow Northern Oklahoma boy like me, who, one of the best editors in the United States of America. And we're so privileged to have him here as a dean. And also one of the nicest guys I know. And John Schmelzer. You know, John doesn't like to talk much about himself, 
but he's seen a lot, a lot over the years. Another Pulitzer Prize winner. And I had the honor of teaching with him and observing with him. And, and I have to tell you, when it, in the classroom, he's the best I've ever seen. He is responsible for so many great things that come out of this college, John Schmelzer. I want to start off on a quick personal note. When I left this university in 1976, uh, um, about six years later, I found myself in Beirut covering the Israeli invasion of Lebanon for then a fledgling small 24-hour network called CNN that people made fun of. And after the invasion was complete and the encirclement of West Beirut was complete, word came to us at the Commodore Hotel in Beirut that there was a horrible massacre in two Palestinian refugee camps called Sabra and Shatila. And when I got there, to this day, it's the most horrific sight I've ever seen. The estimates of the dead range anywhere from 750 to 3,500. I can tell you it was more in the thousands. And those images stick with me. But in those days, before the internet era and, and the ease of use of satellite technology, when we went in there and covered that traumatic thing, and we were traumatized, and those who survived were traumatized as they saw men, women, and children with their throats slit and murdered by the thousands there. To get that material out, we had to hand it off to a taxi driver who would drive it to the Israeli border, who would then hand it off to someone who would drive to Tel Aviv and put it on the lone satellite we could use to get it out. There were two telexes that could be used at the Commodore Hotel. People were fighting to get on those telex machines to send their stories. Phone communication was horrible. And now if we would have covered that, and I've thought about this in this era, before we even got there, the world would know because it would be all over social media. And our editors would already have their, their stories framed in their mind, what they wanted to see, our victims, and their stories would already be out there, and we're seeing this this morning in the train crash in Hoboken, where the first video and images and responses to what was happening in the train crash in Hoboken, New Jersey this morning came from social media. So we're going to talk about trauma and coverage in the digital age. And Ed Kelly, I want to start with you first. With you were editor of the Oklahoman in 1995, and I think that was as you told me this morning, the last big major event of the analog era. Can you elaborate on that more and how it's changed? Well, it, it really was in many ways, Mike. Um, really, we had a website at the time at the Oklahoma, and I think the Tulsa World did as well, and there were obviously other traditional news, or traditional, uh, news organizations around the company. country that had websites, but like us, they really didn't know what to do with it. Really, the only reporting that got done on that first day of the bombing was here at at OU, at the Oklahoma Daily. The Oklahoma Daily had a site, and they did some reporting uh, off of that, off the, the breaking news of this big story. But uh, So it was, a, it was a different era back then. Stories weren't big stories, particularly disasters, weren't broken as they are today, as Mike said, by social media. They were broken by television, particularly cable TV, and in this case, particularly CNN. So you can imagine in Oklahoma City the swarm of television from all over the country, including lots and lots of local stations that sent their own crews and their own trucks to Oklahoma City. Uh, as newspapers, uh, although certainly not in the breaking news business, were there to supply, supply lots of context. It seems very quaint now and it's really laughable, but we considered putting out what used to be called a special edition or a special section that day uh, to get news to our readers. We decided in the middle of the day that logistics were too much and I'm glad we didn't do it because of the uh, uh, because we have plenty of other things to do. But um, one thing that working uh, in, that, in that era allowed us to do at the Oklahoma in that day was the, to try to report on as thorough, thoroughly as we could the incessant rumor that was going around that the bombing had been, called, had been caused by Middle Eastern terrorists. And so we pursued this with 
sources we had in Oklahoma City with the FBI, some other people that we knew, knew in Washington and New York. And at the end of the day, right before our print deadlines in the evening, we decided we're, despite what others were reporting, particularly on television, we just don't feel secure enough that we have enough information to really say that this is, is true. So we made kind of one passing reference to a story that was inside the paper and let it, let it go at that. Turned out, of course, it was not the work of Middle Eastern terrorists. Uh, if that story would have happened just a year later, in 1996 rather than April 1995, I think it would have been completely different for us and everybody else who was in the fledgling days of uh, internet or digital journalism that there would have been a lot of pressure on us as a hometown news organization to uh, not only report on that, but perhaps even, even put out a story on our website, newsok.com, that, well, this rumor is floating around. Try to fuzz it up. We're not quite sure whether it is or not, but we're going to put it out there because everybody else is putting it out there. So there were advantages to being in that era, and like I said, in my opinion, it's the last big story in this country of that era, to be able to reflect during the day, do as much reporting as you can, and then decide whether or not to do anything with it. Hannah, in 2006, you and I were in Baghdad, and that was when Twitter was born in 2006. And I kind of remember our editors back in New York saying, you got to take a look at this. You might, you know, it might come in handy, might use it. Uh, it didn't really impact your coverage so much in Baghdad, but it would later on in the Arab Spring. Could you talk about that and your thoughts about how this has all changed in covering trauma in the digital age? Uh, sure, absolutely. It, um, now I look back at Baghdad and I think all the times that I could have done so much more had there, uh, had there um, been social media as prevalent <coughs> as it is today. So, I mean, at the time I did have a blog and so that was where uh, I would put things that today I would have put on Twitter or Instagram. So um, I go and I interview a militia leader and his child says something funny or his wife comes and shows him up or you know, some funny aside that, or something insightful or that takes you right there to the place that might not have um, a place to, you know, you can put it in your story but it shows you something about where you are and what's happening in the war. Um, funny remarks of troops, for example, or that really actually got to um, issues of morale, for example, and PTSD and all those sorts of things that now we talk about widely on social media. So um, I, I look back and I think, oh, if only I had had that. So all of that changed when in the Arab Spring where um, I was bureau chief in Cairo and I had sort of six simultaneous <laughs> revolts happening. And so I'm trying to cover Yemen and Bahrain and Syria and Libya and Tunisia and Egypt uh, where I lived um, with a newborn. <laughs> and so it was uh, a pretty crazy time. And so a lot of what I could do during the day when the government didn't completely shut down uh, internet for a while is I would just you know constantly update what I'm seeing we're being attacked with um, tear gas here. And it was also um, very important, <coughs> apart from reporting as a safety mechanism. You know, don't go on this bridge, they're waiting, you know, they can ambush you, don't go over here, uh, watch out, there's pro-regime march coming down this street. And so on a number, uh, in a number of ways, it was, it was so much more um, helpful to coverage, to safety, um, and in Baghdad, I mean, I just wish we'd had that, and I think we could have been a lot smarter. We did have, and do have, um, closed Facebook chat groups um, that kind of tell you that sort of thing, but the real-time feed of Twitter um, is, uh, is great. There are downsides, too, though, and I think that pressure to, um, to be first is, is so much more intense, and you see people, you know, on Instagram that I feel sometimes, you know, are you, do you need to be that close to the ISIS flag or are you doing that to have the like cool black flag in the, <laughs> in the picture to show you're right there on the front line and sometimes I think it can lead to recklessness. I think there are also ethical issues when you're at a scene like Sabra Shatila, you know, I've seen that scene in Baghdad when there was a, a terrible stampede where 1,000 bodies are laid out in front of me. And if I'd snapped away, I mean, that raises ethical 
issues as well. Like, do we just publish? We certainly can't do that for troops, for US forces when we're embedded because of rules. So then it gets into this, you know, sort of squirrely debate over, over all of that. So I think it's overall net positive. It's helped my work in so many ways. It's a repository for all the cool little anecdotes I can't get into my stories. It um, adds the color and takes people there <coughs> viscerally in a way that they will never just from reading. Um, but I think we have to also unplug, think, <laughs> take a break from it. Because I don't know about you, but my Twitter feed can be, you know, it's sometimes it's just a steady stream of bad stuff, you know, sort of humans behaving badly all over the world. And it, it takes a toll on you. Absolutely. Yeah. Haley, you uh, are a product, grew up in the digital age, in the age of social media, and looking at the Los Angeles Times submissions uh, to the Pulitzer Committee, uh, you follow all of the social media. I mean, you tweeting out, you know, uh, police cars racing to the scene. And tell us how that impacted your, your coverage and what, what the pressure was like that, that social media presented in, in covering this and, and, and eventually winning a Pulitzer. Sure. Um, we actually learned the news on Twitter. Um, this was December 2nd, and, um, you know, this had the, the difference of being here. Um, this was in our city. You know, it's not a place where you expect something like this to happen. Um, we uh, we had we were a week removed to the day from losing 20% of our newsroom to buyouts. So we had all come back. We had lost about 80, 80 to 90 reporters. Um, so we had all come back to work. This is the week after Thanksgiving, and you know it was kind of mid morning. We were all feeling sorry for ourselves and somebody saw a really vague tweet from San Bernardino that said up to 20 dead. And, and as soon as that tweet went out, we hadn't even determined what had gone on. We were in the car, um, myself and a couple other people. Um, it's 60 miles east. Um, so LA traffic, you know, it can be anywhere from an hour to three. Um, so we, we raced there. Um, and they, they had the city locked down really quickly. Um, with social media, we just had to move so fast. Um, within the first hour, even before I and, my, and the other reporters got to the scene, um, our team in the newsroom had more than a dozen posts um, saying, you know, people are hiding in buildings. This is what we know so far. Um, you know, police are looking for the shooters. They didn't know what's going on. Um, and the San Bernardino Fire Department, you know, again, while we're driving out there, they put out an official tweet that said, live updates on today's events can be found on the LA Times website. So there was that pressure from this official agency saying, you know, turn to them, they've got the information. And so by the time we got there, you know, it's chaotic. People are coming out of the building. They had just started letting people out of it. Um, you know, I started tweeting and the other people started tweeting. Um, and we were, we were spread out, it's a, it's a big spread out city. And um, I tweeted out some video of where the, the chase started, you know, cause there were all these false rumors, you know, there were two shooters, people said there were three, you know, there were people, you know, just mass confusion. Anytime you have a disaster like this, there was. Um, and so anything we put out, it was basically publishing on the spot. You know, we had to be so careful not to go with rumors. We had to verify everything. <laughs> Um, everything I tweeted out, I knew, like, this better be right because it's getting retweeted. People were following this. Um, you know, we had to know the hashtags while we're on the field talking to victims. Um, so it was, you know, people followed it so closely. Um, and so that really, part of our entry for the Pulitzer, Pulitzer um, entry was the live blog, which was largely our tweets from the field. And so while we were doing this, you just have to keep in mind you know, while you're right there, you know, okay, I can't in between these things be tweeting about, you know, my birthday or something personal. You know, you just have to have to be so cognizant of what you're doing and know that everyone's watching this. And and you just had to turn things around so quickly. We we within the um the shooting was shortly before noon. Uh, by 11 p.m., not counting the dozens of other stories, our, our main story on the website was updated 22 times. Um, so that's just the amount of publishing we did instantly. Thank you. 
very insightful. John, uh, in, I know one of the first panels you were on uh, ever that you did in your career was uh, the impact of trauma on the emerging technology of radio. And um, it's supposed to be funny, guys. Radio is. <laughs> Man, wake up, folks. <laughs> John, you've seen a lot of things and, and, and trauma uh, and, you know, and co your coverage of the aviation industry, which won you a Pulitzer. I mean, you've, you've seen uh, horrific plane crash scenes. And, and, and working as a uh, reporter, then editor during that era, and now as, a, as an instructor of, of young journalists coming up, are there some of the same tools we still carry with us despite... Uh, what social media and other technology we have has, has impacted? Some of, the, some of the same tools are there that we're using, but we're using a lot newer tools. Uh, this device is becoming the standard, and we are now teaching students more and more that this should be their go-to advice device, uh, for not only for providing videos and pictures, but also for storytelling because they can go and take notes, they can go and do their stories, they can go and put it on Instagram, they can twi tweet it out. There's so many ways you can use this device to go and help with your storytelling. Um, and we're, you know, I think back to Melissa Foy and she graduated in 2011, I think 2012. So, yeah. um, and it was when Mike and I were doing a project called Afghan 101. Uh, Mike was deployed to Afghanistan um, with the 101st Airborne, and we were traveling back and forth to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, seven rotten times in a <laughs> university van uh, going back and forth with students to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Well, one of the times when we went, I think it was the second trip, uh, Melissa was uh, had gone with this group, and we had another woman with us from uh, a photographer whose father was a war photographer in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, and she was an exchange student. And we got there, and we're sitting there talking to the re the rear guard captain. A rear guard captain is someone that stays back at the base, and you know. Takes, is in charge of the base while the unit is deployed to, uh, uh, in this case, Afghanistan. Anyway, and he mentioned that there was a garage sale going on on the base that day, and it was like, well, so what? And uh, I thought, and Melissa so followed up on that and asked, what kind of garage sale it was? Oh, it's a garage sale for a woman whose husband was killed two months ago. Well, Melissa asked the women that were there who had come to go and work with the, 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 our students, asked if she could go to the garage sale and think, well, she thought, I could go and at least go and talk to this woman. And we were doing the stories about the impact upon the families. Nine hours later, Melissa came back to the hotel. Um, the woman had never been out of the house since the funeral at... Uh, Arlington National Cemetery. Because of Melissa and uh, this other student that were there, she decided she felt comfortable enough to go out of the house for the first time that night. Uh, they went to a concert, uh, and I had to deal with Melissa and the a bus, a van load of women and men who were crying the entire day coming back because the story was so traumatic to them. Uh, so you go and we put, we put students in places that you don't expect there to be trauma, and it turns out you have tremendous trauma. Uh, you go and put people and do things that you don't expect, uh, and you, um, you get prepared, but you're not prepared. You have to think your way through it. I was, you know, when I got asked to do this, and I started doing it this morning again, and I didn't want to remember a lot of things that I've covered. Um, you know, I don't want to go see the 9-11 Museum. I'm sorry. Uh, I covered 9-11. Uh, um, you know, I 
over a thousand souls have died. More than a thousand souls have died in plane crashes that I've covered, and I've covered in person. I don't like to remember that stuff. And I started remembering that today. So this is a difficult thing for journalists. It's going to become more difficult because of this. Police and fire and <laughs> officials have always kept us at bay. This device, this phone, is going to allow us to walk into places where we've never walked into places. It's always been the photographers who are the ones that have been the ones that are taking it in the, in the chops, not the reporters. Now it's the reporters and the photographers. Uh, and the, the issue that uh, we have to face as journalists is to realize that we have to go and deal with this trauma, think about what we're doing, and think about how we can do it in a more safe manner both to ourselves personally and to the people around us. Hannah, I saw you watching intently and shaking your head sometimes when John was speaking. What were you thinking? What, what, how do you react to what John just said? Um, I was thinking uh, that, yes, I, I do agree it can be a lot <laughs> to take in and to keep doing year after year. And um, I was actually thinking about our Pakistani colleagues here and how, you know, it always felt sort of unfair that because of my magical blue passport, <coughs> I could leave Baghdad, you know, I could do six weeks on, two weeks off, and I would think of my Iraqi colleagues who are, I say bye, see you in two weeks, and um, they're still there every day. Mm -hmm. And how um, another benefit of social media is that <coughs> those who are closest to the story, local journalists, um, I mean, there's, there's pluses and minus, the pluses, that they have a voice that before it was sort of the Western um, foreign correspondent coming in, saying, go and interview all these people. You take up their interviews and you write it up. And if you're nice and generous, you give a co-byline. But a lot of times, all of those contributions were not uh, recognized. And that's been a big change. And now, um, you know, even if they're working as quote unquote fixers, um, you know, with Western reporters, I really do like the fact that they're they now have their own Twitter accounts and their own Instagram accounts. And so I think that's really important. Um, and also there are more programs in place now um, to keep them safe. I mean, I remember you know, instances of working with local reporters where maybe we had um, one flak vest, one Kevlar vest, and it's me and a translator and a driver and maybe a, a bodyguard or something. I'm not gonna put that on and my colleagues don't have it. And so, you know, I think that's where bureau chiefs need to be um, insistent on everyone being protected. And if we are gonna go do this, and if we are gonna see these scenes day after day, everyone on the team needs to have the same level of um, protection, both in country, but also you have to check up on people afterwards. I mean, you know, look at the suicide rate for soldiers, 20 a day, um, you know, because they had this mass mobilization, mass deployment, and we're seeing this impact. You know, a lot of those same um, issues are, uh, you know, our journalists deal with as well. And I remember going to a Dart Center retreat one time and someone saying, journalists are the only first responders that don't have that sort of care. And I thought, started thinking about, am I a first responder? Yeah, often I am on the first one on the scene, not in the terms of you know giving medical aid, but absolutely, you're right there, you see these things, and you have to take care of yourself and others. And, others. and so yes, I, I, I agree with that. Um, but I also wouldn't discount the, um, the positives. Um, when I, I had made some notes on how, you know, sort of helped and hurt, and you know, how the, um, the ability to reach younger readers um, and viewers through Instagram and Twitter can't be overstated. I mean, they are not subscribing to <laughs> the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, one of our papers, um, but they, are, they do follow me on Twitter. And I have a different voice on Twitter and on Instagram than I have in my stories where I have to be all, you know, it's, and then on Twitter, I'm like, you know, it goes down in the DMs. And it's, uh, and, and I mean that in the sense of 
Um, I also, it literally goes down in the DMs, and that's a song, but there's, um, it's the direct messages. And I have sources who can't approach me um, on the street, can't approach me at State Department, can't come to my office, so we do encrypted chats, we do Telegram, or they DM me. And so I get a lot of sources that way too. So, I mean, I just, I really weigh uh, the positives and, and, and negatives. And the other, the last thing is activist journalists, um, so where I was saying it was helpful for local journalists, it can also really compromise the integrity of the reporting if we have all these unfiltered reports coming out of San Bernardino. I saw it after Charlotte, um, just recently after Freddie Gray um, in Baltimore, and um, you, people are on the scene and sometimes it looks like there's been a shooting, it looks like there's been a killing, but we don't know the facts yet. And so, but people on the ground who don't have the same restrictions on publication that we do, will put it out there and they will get their retweets. And then, you know, it just snowballs and then you're, instead of gathering your own news and building from the ground up, you're trying to, you know, verify these wild rumors. And so that, that's been a big issue for Syria, which is a black hole for reporting, where we rely so much on activists. And we honestly, if somebody said, what's the death toll? I don't think we have a clear handle on the death toll. I don't think we know the full picture there because we're so reliant on, uh, on non-journalists to go in. And I mean, pictures, yes, there's, there's photos that come out of there and they're invaluable to showing the suffering in say Aleppo or somewhere, but um, it's, it's, it's bigger than that. And so I, I don't know, I think we're all still wrestling with how do we incorporate the activist journalism and citizen journalism with our journalism, reported journalism, and the accounts of locals who will know the place and the history and the sensibilities better than any of us who parachute in, but also, you have a dog in the fight, maybe, you know? So it's really, it's, these are all issues that I'm glad we're, we're talking about today. Haley, you grew up with that, in that generation, with that digital voice, if you might. You heard what, what Hannah had to say. Do you think we've, you think we've lost our role as uh, gatekeepers at all? That, that, that social media, for example, so outruns us at the beginning that even if we try to sort out Let's say, for example, what Ed was talking about with Oklahoma City and blaming it first on a Muslim conspiracy, which it wasn't. Um, and now you're being bombarded in San Bernardino with all of this stuff in the climate we live in now and, and, and trying to gatekeep but also trying to stay ahead. I mean, that has to be immense pressure. And, and does that role as a gatekeeper still even exist, do you think? Yes. Absolutely. I, I think it's more important now because of that. Um, and it's been challenging because of all of those, you know, especially with a, a major disaster story. Um, false news comes out so quickly um, that there has to be that trusted source that that there are those, those barriers. They're not going to publish it until they get it right. Um, I mean, even with the, um, the Moore tornado in 2013, um, the initial reports were that 90 people were dead. The, I believe it was the medical examiner double counted or, or something like that. Um, and that was up all day long. And it, you know, it took our organizations communicating with officials to, to get that correct because it's, it's such chaos in the beginning. Um, but it also creates, you know, not just for the journalists, it, it creates major pressures for the people who happen to find themselves involved in these stories because with uh, San Bernardino, one of the first victim names to come out and it came out through social media, it was family talking about this person on his Facebook page, um, was a man named Nicholas Thalassinos, um, 52 year old county health worker, um, very active on Facebook and on social media. And so once the names come out, that's the first thing reporters do is turn to their, their public profiles. You start to gather this impression of who is this person? You do it with criminals, you do it with victims, it's just a natural, okay, here's this information. Um, and Nicholas was, um, you know, he, uh, he had a very, he had a Facebook page that was just full of incendiary things. You know, he had very strong views, um, you know, he, he got kicked off Facebook t several times, you know, and he, he called it what was, he called it Facebook jail. Um, you know, he, uh, 
he, he created a second account to use his Facebook page when he was kicked out and on Facebook jail. And so when his name came out, people turned to his Facebook page. Um, and within probably an hour of that coming out, there was a, um, a New, York or New York Daily News uh, headline. There was a columnist who had already done a think piece. And the headline was, San Bernardino killers were radical ISIS-loving monsters, but one of their victims was just as bigoted. And this is somebody who had just died, um, not 24 hours before. His family had just found out. And that got out there really quickly. Um, and people were using screenshots of his Facebook page and screenshots of his tweets. And everyone had formed this opinion about him. And so I, I went and went to his, his widow's house, and she happens to pull up. Um, you know, and you kind of just feel it's a, it's a strange position to be in, to be knocking on doors and, you know, hey, tell me about your husband who just died. Um, and there were TV cameras. We were all waiting at the house, and, and she pulled up, and, you know, she's not had a day to process this. And, you know, she was saying, you know, he's, he's very, you know, proudly conservative, religious. He was a, what's called a Messianic Jew, which is a Jewish people who believe in Jesus. And he wore, you know, seat seats, and he wore a prayer cap and Star of David and would often get in fights with the person who was his colleague who ended up being the killer. And she's saying, you know, in this interview, you know, still having not processed this, saying, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he picked a fight with, with uh, Syed. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he got mad because of this. You know, and she's just processing. You know, and this goes live on TV really quickly. You know, and just the speed of these things. And so I, you know, I did my questions with her as well, and they said, you have to be so careful. You know, I didn't want to pick out pieces of what she said and tweet them out, you know, because she's saying, oh, he's a martyr. You know, and so I, you know, we went back and talked with her and talked with their pastors and did a more nuanced story about how, you know, this image of him was created so quickly because of social media and because of his social media, and he's a victim. So it's, it leads for a lot of good things in reporting, but it can also really lead to harm. You know, he was not a public figure. He didn't think his Facebook page would be splashed across, you know, international news outlets. Um, so it was really complicated. Hannah, do you think that you, us, we as, as journalists have an obligation uh, and, and should it take up part of her time to sec set the record straight that it sometimes that conventional wisdom is false because of how it was portrayed on social media and things that come out. Instead of going out and doing what we normally do, going out, talking to people, finding out ourselves, over here on the other side, everyone's seeing something else coming out. Do you, do you find yourself, uh, did you find yourself in the Arab Spring, for example, trying to set the record straight, exerting energy to do sure. that? Charlotte and Baltimore, um, and after, you know, I cover national security as well, and so it's uh, even after the um, Orlando shooting, and where there were all these wild rumors, and just sometimes I think a worthwhile piece is to just step back and say, everything we knew about this case was wrong. And I mean, every time one of these mass casualty events occurs, one of these, you know, really deadly incidents, um, I think of a couple of things. I think of um, this journalist that I, I love at The Guardian, Spencer Ackerman, he says, um, he says, just remember that one fact uncovered is better than a thousand hot takes, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Just like, just work on uncovering the facts. And the second is the first reports on one of these are almost always wrong. And so every time one of these happens, I retweet that. <laughs> I re just re-up that. <laughs> like, hey, everybody, let's remember. Because there's often not two or three shooters. It's one. Oh, there's not 90 victims. There are three. You know, it's, it's so yes, I think. But that's an adding an extra role. You're there. You're trying to get your own story. And you're trying to do something. And you're sort of policing everything that's out there. And it, it can be... Um, can be difficult. Well, and it's, I think it's led to less, I mean, I, I was seeing reports after the... Um, after, after Orlando, um, I was in Los Angeles at the time, and there was, um, the Pride Parade was that day, and we got very early reports that somebody was driving to that parade with a lot of ammunition, so I was there. Um, and, you know, the number that morning kept changing, I mean, because that's, 
you know, even the police investigation. Uh, social media is even faster than the police who are on the scene giving, you know, giving us the information. And they're, all morning they had said something like maybe 20 dead, and then it rose to 50 and then 49. And one of the first posts I saw on Facebook, someone I, I went to school with said, um, you know, the reports keep changing. This is just the media trying to get us to feel that this is worse than it is. And I think that's led to a lot of distrust from people mm -hmm. when they see stuff oh. that go out, go out immediately and they say, well, it's, it's the media trying to change the story and Absolutely. it's, and you're it has, just moving. It so. has an impact and here's an Oklahoma, a real life impact. I was a senior in high school at US Grant, Southside Oklahoma City, when the Oklahoma City bombing happened and I felt it, we felt it. It was Coach Knight's English class. And we, it was so loud we thought that it was in uh, the, chemi the science lab. We're like, oh, what are they? You know, we were joking about it. And then the news came over the loudspeaker, and then we were herded to an auditorium, and then we watched the um, TV, and then we watched the um, John Doe number one and John Doe number two suspects come out, you know, dark, Middle Eastern, everything. And I'm there grieving with everybody else, and suddenly a kid um, says, Hannah's dad is John Doe number two. And then it became this thing, Hannah's dad is John Doe number two. And it's, it was really painful. And I've always, I'm reminded of that. Like, it's important that we get this stuff right, <laughs> you know? There are personal consequences. And lives can be ruined. I mean, look at the, uh, the Atlanta bombing, I think, the mm -hmm. Olympic bombing. That was a case where somebody, I think, won a lawsuit right. over being named um, so many times because of Reddit and um, sort of, dark internet and all of that, where a lot of these names come up before they're in sort of mainstream media. And the Dallas shooting. The Dallas. Like they had that yeah. poor man's uh, picture up on TV. Oh, Hall yeah, before. right. And he had, like, you know, he was licensed to carry and was exercising his Second Amendment rights. Oh, but he was black. So, and that went, that was a, that was a big ethical fail, I think. Um, yeah. One of the problems that we also face is managing the expectations of our editors. Our editors are draw, drawing their earliest conclusions from what is moving on social media, and the reporters and photographers on the scene are having to push back on their editors and say, give us time, you're wrong, uh, let us go and figure this out. And some of the, good, the better papers will step back, some of the worst, some of the not so good papers, uh, the editors, it's a top-down management style, and the unfortunately, and the reporters are chasing the story that the editor assigns, and it's our job to push back and go and say, no, we're not going to do that story because it's not correct. I want to open this up for questions for about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Do we have any questions from the audience? And I'll come up to you with the mic. Yes, sir. Hold on. Let me come to you. Um, you just commented on um, reporters holding their editors accountable. Um, what do you think about things like native advertising, where uh, basically where newspapers and, and online magazines and such like uh, they're they get so crowded with um, advertisements and things like that, and, and so much information, like you said, goes out that's, that's incorrect. How would one, as a reporter, hold their editor accountable and say, we can't do this story until we know for a fact that all these things are correct? The, um, was your, as you were asking the question, I was thinking about an ad that ran in the Chicago Tribune, and I'm desperately trying to remember who it was that placed the ad, and I can't remember. But it was a picture of a building on North Michigan Avenue, and I, I, I want to say it was Google, uh, and they had the stupid building on the wrong side of the street <laughs> because it was shot from, it was shot from, it was, they were using a, a Google algorithm to go and get the picture. and. The editorial department stepped in and hammered the story, had hammered the ad saying it was wrong. The, editor the advertising department, the Tribune, said we were costing them millions of dollars and trying to stop us from doing the story. <laughs> um, we ended, and anyway, it ended up with the, uh, the advertiser 
redoing, you know, rerunning the ad with the with the building on the correct side of the street. So yeah, we have an obligation to go and push back and and you know and hold the advertisers accountable, just as we go and hold citizens accountable. Thank you. We have a question here. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you guys all for uh, joining us today. Um, I do have a question. Uh, you spoke a little bit about um, social media and its impact on trauma coverage. Um, I wanted to know more about what you guys think. Um, is social media kind of dehumanizing? It's the, the reality of what's happening um, in these situations. Um, I know a little while back there was that the picture of the Aleppo boy, the fa very famous photo of the Aleppo boy and how much attention that brought to the situation in Syria. I just wanted to know um, what you guys thought about social media and its effects. Is it dehumanizing or is it, you know, the attention we need? Well, you know, I, this, this is something that is, a, I mean, this is a very current struggle that I have right now. And I go back and forth because it's, we're talking about the Black Lives Matter protests, we're talking about refugees, mm -hmm. and I see the arguments. I see, you know, very powerful arguments that, you know, Emmett Till's mother wanted an open casket to show the world what this ugliness looked like, and that galvanized uh, communities. And so that was, but at the same time, <coughs> Are we deadening ourselves, numbing, numbing ourselves when it's a steady stream of this and if nothing changes? I, so I see the other argument where it's, um, it's the fetishization of, uh, it's like a, a pornography of violence, you know? And, we, and to what end to see broken and bruised and dead um, black, brown, whatever bodies from all over the world? I mean. Alan Kurdi, uh, um, the little Syrian boy, I mean, the sad part is he's not an anomaly. That happens daily. Kids wash up daily on those shores. And while it was, I think, a profound moment that we all had a gut check, like, yeah, this is still happening, we were also happy to move right along. And so uh, is it useful? Is it, um, is it just sort of a, a prick at our collective conscience now and then, but nothing really changes. I think, you know, it's, it's a real, it's a hard one because, I mean, traditionally I have been all for marketplace of ideas. You put it out there. I grew up partly in the Middle East where everything is out there. And um, there's a, the reality is something that we live with every day, bombings, occupation. I mean, all these, um, all these, ills that people deal with and you know I think that's important to document but um, I think that we should also not have that be the sole lens that we look upon any one community hi thank you um, you mentioned earlier that you um, that you tweet a lot and you I'm right here okay. that you tweet a lot that you reach out to younger audiences because younger audiences aren't necessarily subscribing to newspapers um, and it, it got me wondering about the commercial aspects of the business we are all in um, we can't make news if we're not getting paid and we're not getting paid if ads aren't being sold when you're out there on the fly posting or tweeting or Instagramming, do you keep any space in your mind for trying to get them to, to direct them to the website to get traffic across those sites? How much time do you spend? I, I know you mentioned you were doing it really, really fast. Do you think about that when you're doing that? I mean, does the commercial aspect of what you're trying to do enter into your equations? Um, for me personally, it's, it's not so much a commercial aspect. I mean, obviously it helps you know, I, I can pull up the LA Times website as an employee at any time and see exactly how many people are on the site at all times. We've all got numbers in our head, and unfortunately it drives a lot more than it should. But with breaking news, I mean, I try as much as I can to, to also tweet links to stories with my tweets, not so much for the commercial side, but just so people have that greater context than 140 characters. Um, you know, and we, we have a great social media team um, that knows which reporters are on the field and they'll use the official newspaper's account to tweet my stuff, you know, which again is more 
got to be cognizant of what I'm putting out there. But um, for me, it's more about just drawing people to the larger story than the than the commercial side of it. But but the numbers definitely are on our minds all the time. We we live and die by the click now, and that's just the reality of it. And so. I mean, you asked me two years ago, I would have never retweeted one of my stories or anything anybody said about my stories. I still don't do that. Like, the arcane compliments is still way too icky for me. <laughs> but even, you know, because that's not why you get into it. That's not why you just want to do good work. And now it's like you have to do good work and say, look at my good work. <laughs> and, and it's something weird about that. And I'm not completely comfortable with it, although I'm trying to take a page from my younger colleagues who, you know, tweet out all their stories. And yeah, the self-promotion, because you have to. I mean, that's just, you know, if you want to stay in the game, you have to, you have to do uh, at least some of that. Uh, with the increased uh, politicization, excuse me, <clears throat> politicization of the media and the perception of the media, how do you guys um, personally combat the kind of like the difference between your print media and your entertainment-based, ratings-based media, and their almost immediate reaction to rush to judgment and throw out all these hypotheticals, and when you're trying to conduct, I guess, legitimize like reports on what's actually happening how do you combat that that urge to you know the back and forth i'm sorry it's hard <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i i you know my husband will laugh at me with how much i guard all of my social accounts even even facebook i've, I've got that locked down that's personal nobody can see that unless they're a family or friend um i don't put any opinions out there on anything um and it's really, really challenging, and I, and I don't know the answer to that, because when people refer to the media, you know, capital T, capital M, people don't see the differences. You know, we're not out there analyzing. We're not out there, you know, four screen faces. Um, and so it's, I think it's our job, I guess, to, to explain that. Um, you know, I don't know where our editorial writers sit. Um, and I, I admire that about our newspaper. We keep that steady wall between the two. Um, but it's, it's more challenging, especially with social media. And we've, we've had several uh, emails from our high up editors uh, during this campaign to the entire staff. It says, do not comment on the election. Um, you know, don't, you know, if you don't write about politics, don't weigh in. Um, and that, that's hard because people want to. That's, you know. It's really tempting, but it's it's getting harder. Hey, um, may I just add one thing on that? Um, I used to have a real problem with that too, like where it's the you know entertainment uh, seeping into you know the infotainment sort of movement, and um, I've come around a little bit on that because of I think BuzzFeed and Facebook, and um, it was something I heard. Um, maybe it was the. Uh, you know, an exec at Facebook or somewhere, maybe it was BuzzFeed, who basically described this sort of cafe model where if I'm at a cafe in Paris and I'm reading the newspaper and I'm reading about a terrible bombing and then I look over and say, oh, that's a cute kid. And then I go back and then I read about this election and in, in Egypt and then I look up and it's like, oh, nice day. Oh, I like that song that's on. Like that is, if you look at that, that's sort of what our Facebook feed is like, you know, it's cute kid, animals, um, somebody's video, uh, oh God, uh, you know, refugees. You know, it's, it's really like, it's like that. And so I think that now our brains are conditioned to, you know, process that information like that. It's, it's still a worrisome sort of blend for me, but I think that people are kind of coming around to the fact that one news source can sort of have all of those different elements. Good question in the back. Um, I've recently become obsessed with the idea that objectivity doesn't hold up anymore in journalism and my idea behind that is because the media that I see shared on social media by people who aren't in the media is normally on the right or it's on the left and it tends to be backing up uh, an idea that they already had and anything that is seen with objectivity, uh, like places like the Washington Post or the New York Times that they actually do good work, they're all immediately labeled the liberal media. So, and it relates to the last question a little bit, but w what do you guys think about uh, that, that pillar of journalism, of objectivity, of being this omniscient thing that's just telling the facts 
and I, I think that that and and it, whether or not it's 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 hurting journalism and and going away, and if we need to 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 find something else to to kind of be our pillar rather than objectivity. Objectivity uh, and it's um, <clears throat> has been around, or the issue of objectivity and a journalist role, and it's been around forever and ever and ever. Let's say, for example, that you're assigned to go cover a murder trial at the Cleveland County Courthouse. Well, you and your editor talk about how long you're going to stay. Okay, that's a subjective decision. You're not going to stay maybe all day if the trial lasts nine hours, but you're only going to stay three. You've already, you and your editor have already made a subjective decision how long you're going to be there. Then there's going to be space constraints, uh, either because of time, uh, digitally, or in print because of, of space. Uh, that's another subjective decision that you've already made. And then you're sitting in the courthouse, you're taking notes, you're observing, trying to be more than just a stenographer, but being a true journalist on what's important. Well, those decisions that you're making either consciously or subconsciously, those are subjective decisions as well. So the issue of the, the idea of objectivity has always been one that all of us as journalists have strived for, knowing, of course, that really it is impossible. But I think both Haley and Hannah have described the sort of the real world of journalism that they work in every day these days of particularly on these, these giant calamities and disasters, these huge news stories where those first few minutes or in some cases those first few hours where it truly is a free-for-all. It's scrum. You have people out there who are not journalists but are, are tweeting and, and screaming over their social media that this is going on and that's going on and where is the lamestream media? How come they're not reporting all this? because we're seeing it with our own eyes. Well, I'll give you an example that's not a disaster, but this past winter, uh, late on a Saturday afternoon, it was reported, again on social media, that Antonin Scalia, the Associate Justice, had died in Texas. Obviously a huge story in this country. The New York Times um, was about an hour or so later before they, before they tweeted out that had, and it confirmed that Justice Scalia had indeed died. Well, uh, there was criticism among Times readers, and Times readers are some of those devoted uh, consumers of journalism in this country about, well, where was the New York Times? I was out and about, and I was seeing my, my uh, social media feed blow up that Anthony and Scalia died, and I kept looking for, well, where's, where's the New York Times? And in talking to one of my friends who works at the Times, their reaction was basically, if we're wrong, how do you walk back the death of a Supreme Court justice? How do you walk that back if you're the New York Times? It's one thing if you're somebody else, a private citizen, or working for something that may be more of an entertainment-based site than a, what we would all describe as a news site. But when you're a responsible organization like what Haley and Hannah work for, and like what John worked for for many years at the Tribune in Chicago, how do you take back something of that magnitude? We reported on the front page that the alderman of the first ward had died at 10 p.m. that night. The next morning, the city editor, first city editor on the desk, moi, gets a phone call from the first ward alderman saying, I'm very much alive. <laughs> Try to walk that baby back. <laughs> uh, before we wrap this up, uh, Hannah and Haley, I'd like you to introduce your family members who are here, and that will lead to my final question. And he's taking a I nap. Know, so I don't wake him up. I hope this was more exciting for everyone else because my son is asleep in the second <laughs> row. <laughs> but yes, my mother is here, Beverly, and my son, Bilal, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I've learned in trauma journalism retreats is that no matter how hard it is on um, those who are out doing it, we have the excitement and the adrenaline and the story and the instant gratification and this being witness to this momentous occasion and that it's always harder for the folks back home who don't have that. They have the fear and the concern. So before I get into the ugly cry, I just want to say thank you, Mom, for everything. <laughs> Uh, my dad, Jason Branson, is here today. He's my taxi cab for the weekend. Um, and my honorary grandma, Gloria, is sitting right next to him. This, she, she hired me when I was 15. Um, and to your point about that, when I was in San Bernardino, my mom texted me 
I said, you're not there, are you? <laughs> and I sent her a picture of an armored police car going by. <laughs> to, and she responded with a picture of her hand that said, I'm going to slap you when you get home. Because <laughs> I couldn't answer any more texts. I was watching these police go by. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely appreciated to have supportive family at home. Uh, and, um, and that leads me to the final question. You've already really posed it. But, and we're going to deal more with this at UCO in the afternoon. But, but personally, you know, with you and your families and, and witnessing trauma, and when you had time to decompress after a San Bernardino and all of that, um, are you different? Are you different than when, how are you different than when you left Oklahoma and made that brave step overseas? And how are you different when you left Oklahoma and went to Los Angeles and covered these things? Um. Yes, it's now, you know, things that were, that seemed to be really big deals, you know, you just kind of let stuff slide. And it's much harder to, um, I, I don't get angry about the, the same kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, I try not to be, you know, self-righteous when my friends are like, does this, I don't like this dress. And I'm like, do you know people are dying in Syria? I don't want to be that person. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be <laughs> that you know, the party pooper. But at the same time, yes, I think that there is, um, I, you know, one of the most transformational things I learned about covering trauma came from Alana Newman right here from Tulsa. Uh, incredible. I saw when I was at Harvard as a Neiman fellow, she came. She didn't remember me. That's okay. But <laughs> she, she came and uh, presented and showed two I mean, I remember brain scans, and it was sort of like, this is your brain, this is your brain on trauma. Is if I, you know, I'm way oversimplifying your years of research. <laughs> but it was absolutely transformational for me to understand that it wasn't about, you're too weak to do this, you don't have what it takes, you don't have, I mean, there's actual phys physiological effects on your brain when you do this. So take care of yourselves if you do this. And so I've learned that absolutely, you have to take breaks, you have to unplug, and also to be more cognizant of those around you when they're having a hard time because sometimes if we're out in the field and our editors at home don't see that someone's really breaking down, that we should actually serve as that support network. So I hope that that's um, the kind of work that I can, can do now and how I've changed. Um, I would definitely agree with all that. Um, yeah, I too, I too have learned how to, to take care of myself. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a Metro reporter. Um, so, you know, I don't cover the kinds of trauma that you do, but, um, you know, I've seen, you know, people's bodies after they've been shot, and I, you know, I've seen a kid get run over, and, um, you know, all kinds of local trauma. Um, and, I, and, and when I covered the tornado here in Oklahoma City, or in Moore, um, you know, I saw the little girl in her casket, and her sister, her 10-year-old sister next to her, saying, oh, I was so mean to you. Um, you know, after something like that, I, I've learned to actually, you know, if I'm going to see someone later that day, actually say, you know, I, I just need to be alone. Because um, it's really strange when it's, you know, I'm at work, you know, I'm seeing this dead kid on the road, and his grandparents come and pick his backpack up after they've cleaned the body up, and someone calling and saying, hey, let's go to dinner. You know, so I, I've kind of learned to, okay, no, I need this this time for myself. Um, and like you said, it's, it's hard to not be that callous person because we we had a uh, an event last weekend where you know my husband had a, a movie screening in los angeles it was really exciting and um somebody got hit right outside the theater um somebody going 45 miles an hour hit this guy who was between the crosswalks and he was really you know we went up and talked to the officer and he said well you know he's in bad shape but he's gonna make it you know he's alive and so in my mind, it's like, okay, he's fine. You know, the screening was great, and my husband is just really shaken up. So it's hard. You have to kind of recognize, you know, oh, we're a little more callous than, than we should be, and to kind of pay attention to how other people are, are feeling about things. Yeah, my editor used to say, when, when you stop, uh, you know, I, I remember a scene in Lebanon where I called him, and I could barely even dictate over the phone because I was just gasping and crying and it was just uh, a lot of dead children from the Israeli airstrike and um, I, I said I'm so sorry I'm so sorry Mark I'm so sorry I, I'm trying and he said look the day that that doesn't bother you is the day you need to come home so that's that's sort of my maximum well 
Uh, go ahead. No, no, you, you, no, no, please, please, that's it. Uh, He's a deep. I wanted to. <laughs> no, no, after you. <laughs> but he doesn't find the chat. Uh, no. Uh, both Hannah and Mike have mentioned our friends from Pakistan down here, and um, uh, I'm going to tell you a personal story. Uh, we here at Gaylord College have, uh, have the benefit of bringing these folks here on these uh, grants that we administer with the United States State Department. They spend time in Norman, then they spend time in St. Louis, and then they spend a few days in Washington, D.C. I've had the opportunity over the last year to accompany two of these groups when they go to Washington, D.C., and one of the places that I like to take them is the museum, the Museum of News. I hope all of you have had a chance to go to Washington and see it. If you haven't, you really need to do it if, you're, if you love the news like we do. And on the third floor of the museum is a place that's simply called the Journalist's Memorial. It's on the west side of the building. And I like to take these Pakistanis up there because what you have in that memorial is basically glass walls with names of journalists from around the world, not just U.S.-based journalists or Western-based, but from around the world that have died reporting in a post-9-11 war world, basically since 2001. There are all these names by year and the country where all these men and women uh, lived, as well as another, another wall with photos of all of these people. It's very humbling to see these uh, fellow these fellow journalists from Pakistan. When I when I take them up to the third floor, they immediately go to the walls and then they start talking to me about, yeah, that guy. I had lunch with him two days before he died, or I knew his sister. I went to school with her, or he had a wife and two kids. They were four and two, or. They were planning, he and his wife were planning on taking a, a belated honeymoon when he was killed. So to me, it was a reminder that for those of us who are, who are based in journalism in the Western world, particularly the United States, you know, I like to think as a former editor that the worst thing that could probably happen to me was being sued by a lawyer. But in places like Pakistan, where they're doing, where journalists do nothing short of heroic, courageous work, obviously the stakes are much higher than that. Well, Hannah, Haley, Ed, and John, I'm easily uh, the most impressive panel I've ever moderated in my life. And I appreciate all of you, what you're doing here at Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma. Even though our football team is not winning that much this year, it's great to know that our graduates are winning every day out there. So thank you very much. You guys are great. Nothing short of